And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and raise your hand uh, and we'll pause, use the microphone so we get this on, on record and so that everyone can hear you. And I would love to see what your, your thoughts are in translational research. So uh, I'm Nam Tran, I'm one of the assistant clinical professors at UC Davis Medical Center in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine. And I help oversee the uh, clinical chemistry section in the hospital and the clinical chemistry being all the laboratory tests related to testing blood samples, urine samples, and so forth. And we get about 5.5 million tests per year. So you can see what the volume is for these types of laboratory tests. But I want to get a good take on where you all are from. So are you all from UC Davis? UC so you're all from all over? How about you? Where are you from? Utah Valley, wow. How about you all over there? San Jose, great. I'm from the Bay Area, Santa Clara. How about you? San Jose. San Jose, good. You? Oh, wow. Okay. How about you back there? Okay. So uh, kind of get a take. So are, you, are all you pre-med, pre-graduate school, both, thinking both? Or uh, what's the take on this um, in terms of where you want to go with translational research? Thinking about it, you've heard it before, think it sounds great, right? Okay. Yes? Absolutely. No, that's a great reason for going into this, and I hope I point everyone in the right direction in terms of translational research. I come from a slightly unique background. My PhD was in comparative pathology here at UC Davis. I was a biochem major here as an undergraduate. I did a master's in pharmacology toxicology, and somehow I found myself doing research in burn surgery, which was a fascinating field, which I still do. And then quickly I then found out that I was going to help run a whole entire health systems clinical laboratory. So I went from just a mere scientist to someone that supports clinical services at UC Davis Medical Center and uh, does research across the country in terms of burns. And so I use that as an example that you are not limited to what your degree is in. You're more or less limited to what you're exposed to, what you want to do, and your motivations to do that. And so let's first describe our learning objectives, and the first being that we first have to really define what translational research is. We want to describe the process of translational research, identify the current challenges in conducting translational research, describe examples of translational biomedical research and its impact on current medicine, so that's the key question there. How do we actually get the great technologies, discoveries out to the bedside? And then to understand the role of you, the scientists, the physicians, the patients, and their role in team-based translational research. So let me ask you, what's translational research? We kind of have a sense of what it is, but what is the real definition? Now that's the same response I got in the workshop before. That's good. Let's first talk about what basic science is. I hope I don't uh, upset anyone in the basic science world because this is really from the National Science Foundation, so they're saying it, not me. And basic science is an extremely important field, and it's classified as laboratory-based studies without thought of practical ends that results in knowledge, general knowledge, and understanding of nature and its laws. The example I like to give is you're a basic science researcher who found a protein that's upregulated, that appears in some kind of disease. You do further research on it, not knowing what it actually does. You may find out that that protein doesn't do a single thing. You may find out that the protein is the best marker for cancer. Or you may find out that this protein is a small piece of a larger puzzle that helps you discover the process of another disease. No one knows, but that's the excitement in basic science research. You're explorers. Clinical research, the other end of the spectrum, this is kind of where I started in, and it's really about patient-oriented research, epidemiological, behavioral, or outcomes health services research as defined by the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Translational fit, uh, research really fits in the middle. The definition's not completely codified. People have tried to define it, such as the NIH, mainly because it keeps evolving. It's an evolving field, just as medicine is. But NIH says that translational research fosters multi-directional integration of basic science 
patient-oriented and population-based research with the long-term aim of improving health of the public. And the multi-directional part is very important. And that's because what you learn to help humans could help the animals that you use to discover those treatments for people. And the technologies you developed amongst these two species can also further be, be further developed for other innovations and so forth. Well, what are the challenges? Why isn't there a lot of translational research? There is still yet to be a truly recognized field called translational science in that I can't just go out there and put on my resume and say, I'm a translational scientist. People go, what's that? You did your degree in pathology. You're a pathologist. True. But I feel that I am more so of a translational scientist. There's a lot of barriers to that. It's very similar to other barriers out there, but I want to highlight, for example, geographical barriers, communication barriers, cultural barriers, money, funding. Geographical barriers we can relate to. It's hard to work with UCSF because they're down the Bay Area, hour and a half away. It's hard to work with NIH. They're all the way in Maryland. It's much easier for me to walk down the hall and talk to a colleague at UC Davis. But the problem is we still have barriers here at UC Davis. Here's the map. There's UC Davis on the main campus, School of Medicine campus in Sacramento, 20-minute gap. And you'll be surprised at that. That is a huge barrier. I've had engineers that I've worked with having a hard time, whether it be time, timing, driving, traffic, whatever it is, to drive that 20-minute stretch to come see us in Sacramento. The other end of the spectrum is true as well. The surgeons, the clinicians have schedules that may not be permissive of coming down to the main campus in the middle of the day. Surgeons have to do surgery. Communication barriers, lack of common experience. A surgeon may talk differently than a pathologist. An engineer will talk differently compared to a biologist. Confusion between the symbol and the symbolized object. What, how I see things will differ from others. So for example, you look into the sky, you see a cloud, and the cloud looks like an airplane to you. Another person may see a bird. The same is true in terms of translational science. Overuse of abstractions. Abbreviations are the best example. An abbreviation in my field may, will may, mean something different in another field. And interference. Communicating to someone, say by email, you happen to watch TV at the same time and you just keep that email very short, it may not be descriptive enough, especially in between different disciplines, there are misunderstandings, miscommunications that can occur. So let me ask you this. What does PCR stand for? Polymerase chain reaction. I think all of us can appreciate that, especially those in biology. And I feel the same way. Amongst non-biologists, engineers, statisticians, they think principal component regression. It's a mathematical technique or statistical technique to analyze data. My thesis was using PCR. I posted a beautiful poster with PCR labeled on it. An engineer came up to me and said, why are you using principal component regression for this? And I realized we have many all too common abbreviations out there. In the telecommunications world, it's peak cellular rate. US Postal Service, postal carrier route. <laughs> List goes on of many different things out there. Start playing around with the abbreviations between veterinary medicine and human medicine. You'll find that it's quite uh, interesting and lots of confusions can arise from there. Cultural barriers. I call it cultural in parentheses because I'm talking about professional cultural barriers. So as the example, one of my colleagues, he's a surgeon, burn surgeon, wakes up at 4.30 in the morning so he can get to the hospital at 5.30 a.m., hopefully end their day at 7 p.m. on a good day. Scientists, and this is not to detract from scientists because I am a scientist and I, I don't necessarily apply to this, but some scientists work from 8 to 5. Others don't. But they may be used to that schedule, or their staff are used to that schedule. We have staff members that are on the clock. They have to work from 8 to 5. That's just the way it is. But when you want to work with a surgeon, the surgeon goes, hey, you want to meet with me at 6 AM at Starbucks? You might have a problem. Might be, you might not understand that. I've had situations where we have folks from the basic science world that may get upset. Why is the surgeon so late? He told me to meet with them at 5 o'clock. I just said, well, the, someone's not doing too hot over there at the hospital. The surgeon has to deal with it first. I'm sorry, patient care comes first. Sometimes we don't understand because we're not working in that field. And it's totally understandable. But we have to understand each other to get solutions um, developed and solve problems quickly. Physicians may be used to things to happen very quickly. I call upon my colleagues in trauma surgery. They have to move at a fast pace or people will die. They're used to results showing up in a matter of seconds, laboratory results. I asked in the last workshop, what do you think of PCR, polymerase chain reaction, being conducted in a single one-hour test? 
unbelievable, not, not possible. So for biologists out there where you took four or five hours to do a PCR test, you're amazed. We need to be that fast because in trauma surgery or other conditions, they have to be fast because lives are at stake. However, when, you're trying, when surgeons are trying to apply that speed to just simple research, it might not work well because you sometimes can't rush quality. Again, we have to meet in the middle to work together to understand each other where sometimes we have to be fast, sometimes we have to be methodical. Often clinicians may do something because we've always done it that way. Antibiotic therapy for infections, for a severe infection. You might be treated for 14 days of antibiotics by IV. I asked, why 14 days? Why not 16? Why not 10? The clinicians tell me, we've always done that. There's no studies to show that 14 days is the gold standard to do that. But the clinicians do it because it is what's been done for a while. And then lastly, but certainly not least, not all clinicians have the time or may be interested in research. That's not a bad thing. They're busy people too. And they went into that field to do patient care. However, all of us, including scientists and clinicians alike, have one thing in common, and we want to improve things, and we have to work together to do that. And, when, and to do that, we first have to talk about barriers. So the other barrier that we run into, in addition to communications and cultural barriers, is funding. Money talks, unfortunately. And even more unfortunate is the fact that research and translational research is very expensive. You have a lot of people involved. That means a lot of mouths to feed. So you have to rely on grants. Unfortunately, big NIH grants, the R01 grant, which could be a million, two million, or three million dollars over five years, 11 to 15 percent of people get them, including the top doctors, researchers out there. It's hard. Federal spending goes down, or sometimes goes up and goes down. It's hard to predict. Oftentimes, it just goes down, and it makes it hard to get money. And research fund funding sometimes is very targeted. You might like to do work in a certain field, such as, say, multiple sclerosis, but all the money is going into cancer research. Cancer is no less important, but the money is not evenly distributed sometimes. You have to recognize that. But that's not to discourage all of you from translational research. We need to bridge this gap. Main campus, hospital campus. It's that easy. And to do that, we bridge with translational science. And those of you here that are interested in a field, a career in translational science, that's your job. Your job is to come up with ideas. Your job is to be the glue that holds all these dis different disciplines together. So there is hope. Funding is increasing for translational research, NIH in particular. NIH actually supports what are called F and T and K grants to be able to give money to train future researchers to do translational science. You actually take extra classes. You get research money to do these topics. You get mentorship to do translational research. These are typically MDs, PhDs, MD, PhDs, and so forth, and even veterinary, uh, veterinarians that are involved with this. UC Davis and Stanford have many programs that support this, UCSF too, and the list goes on in many other institutions. And there are grants now that actually require multidisciplinary teams to be formed. You have to have someone that is in surgery. You have to have someone in pathology. You have to have someone in veterinary medicine to be involved to do these studies, highlighting the critical need for translational scientists. So there is a need. These are exciting times. Well, what's the impact of translational science? Has there been a lot? Is this a new thing that we're just slowly realizing? Well, let's talk about diabetes. That's a problem that we all can appreciate. That's a problem that we know is a very big impacting issue in the United States. 9.3% uh, of the population in the United States has diabetes, with 86 million people having what's considered pre-diabetes as of 2012. Do you think this is a global problem? Is diabetes a global problem? Sure. I had a colleague out in Saudi Arabia at a King Faisal Medical Center, and she told me, what do you think our diabetes rate is? What do you think diabetes rate is out in Saudi Arabia? Lower or higher than America? Lower, you got, we got lower, lower, higher. You got one person that says higher. Four, same, Four, 48%. Why? I asked why. And she said, well, people don't exercise much out there. It's too hot. Uh, and maybe they don't like to exercise as much. But their number one food that they like to go to isn't the local foods. They go to the Golden Arches and the Colonel because it's the most popular food out there, Western foods believe it or not. And so this is a big problem globally. It has significant health care burden on us. You have kidney diseases, uh, 
eye diseases, neurological diseases, cardiovascular diseases that come about and add on to the burden of our healthcare system, which is already being strained. And the management of diabetes typically revolves around a compound called insulin. Are you guys all relatively familiar with insulin? It's a hormone that helps regulate blood glucose. My question to you is where does insulin come from? Physiologically, it comes from the pancreas. But where do drug companies get them? You don't know. Well, go back in time, 1920s. We've got biochemists finally figuring out how to purify the compound, the, the hormone, and it actually came from dogs. They realized, let's try pigs. They finally got insulin analogs from pigs, and it required us to understand the physiology of both dogs, pigs, and other species, and biochemistry to do these things. The problem is these compounds, which they did use, sometimes cause allergic reactions in these patients. Makes sense. The body's smart. It goes, this is not my insulin. It will have problems with it. So they tried to get insulin from human cadavers, which, aren't, which is not easy to get. And all these methods are very resource intensive. You have to purify. I'm not sure if those of you that are biochem majors, you're sitting there with a column trying to purify out proteins of some kind. It takes a while. It's costly. And of course, it has some risk to it as well. Well, we fast forward in time, just about 10 years after two guys, Watson and Crick, realized what the structure of DNA was. And they realized that in 1978, a company called Genentech, along with UCSF, were able to manipulate the genome of E. coli by inserting the gene for human insulin and let the E. coli do the job, make and purify insulin. So you can see here that they put it in here and produce more insulin. And you effectively have the first recombinant compound made, in this case recombinant human insulin, and it was FDA approved in 1982 via Eli Lilly. The compound that was produced was identical to physiologic insulin and can be further modified to enhance its effects. Nobel Prize. But without the use of animal models, veterinarians, physiologists, physicians, endocrinologists, the list goes on, biochemists to purify the compounds, and of course, two molecular biologists starting off with the DNA structure, we would not have reached this point. And of course, millions, and actually I would even say billions of people over time have benefited from this discovery. Okay. So what are we doing here at UC Davis for translational research? Some of you from other campuses and so forth, and this is not to detract away all the exciting stuff from there, but I want to hit, with you, uh, hit you with some of the exciting stuff we have here at Davis. And we first have a, translational, a clinical translational science center, a CTSC. It's up in Sacramento. It is actually one of the first clinical translational science awards to fund such a structure, an institution, at, through NIH. Ages ago, people discouraged us from actually applying to this facility. We got it, we were one of the first, why? Well, we have a primate center, we have a vet school. Do the other UCs have a really big primate center or a vet school? No, we're the only ones. So we have a strong resource to do translational research, it made sense. California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, CIRM, funded a facility to do stem cell research here. It's right next door to our CTSC. And both programs support a variety of translational training programs, such as T32, those T grants and K grants I mentioned, to help build a new cohort of translational scientists address real and current and future medical problems. We also have two wonderful classes amongst many others. I highlight these because I teach these two classes and I don't teach them by myself. I can't teach translational science by myself. It's a team of biomedical engineers, pathologists, radiologists, surgeons, veterinary medicine uh, folks, all contribute to these classes. The one on the left is BIM-189C. We use this for engineers and undergrads to train them in clinical sciences. We realize that the engineers need to know about what we do in the hospital site so they can build devices to fix our problems. They're great with math, they're great with building things, they're great with modeling things, but they don't know a lot about why we do things because of these diseases and so forth. So we cover pathology, the process of disease, biomedical technology, the devices we use, and biodesign, how you design to meet our needs in a hospital setting. And we've been doing this since 2008. Just literally last Wednesday, we started a new class, PMD 440, Surgery, Pathology, Radiology, and Translational Sciences. This is what we call SPR for the three different departments that are represented. And Dr. Ai-Jin Wang, who's speaking here at this conference too, is the, our, my co-instructor co for that class. And it's for med students and graduate students, as well as those that are in the residency training program. Uh, T and K scholars, and we do the opposite. We train these clinicians 
about translational animal models. What animals you need to do or use to fix the human problem that you see every day. Biosensors, in vivo imaging methods, the list goes on of various things that we will talk about in that class. And it is our hope that we merge these two classes together at some point this quarter. We have these two entities of people working together to solve a problem. Quite interesting. And we've proven that it works. We've had engineering teams who've taken these classes that have developed a SCAR compliance assessment tool. This is with the Division of Burn Surgery at UC Davis. We have a way to assess how bad a SCAR is so it determines if the surgeon needs to operate on it or to manage it medically or through other means. We have a way to remove the fat tissue, adipose tissue from the underneath, underside of a skin graft. The surgeons currently have to remove it by scissors, by tweezers and so forth. It takes time and it's not consistent. Time matters because they do this in the operating room, okay? So the engineers made a device that effectively just consistently slices off that fat tissue and that's pig tissue right there, so we had to use a pig model for this. We came up with an iPad app to calculate burn size. Burn size is important because it tells us how much fluids we need to give patients when they're burned. And without, if you don't give enough fluids, they go into organ failure. If you give too much fluids, they, go in, they have fluids filling in, filling in places that they shouldn't have fluid in. And normally people do it by eye, which of course leads to inaccuracies. So we came up with an iPad app they can, so they can finger paint into this burn size and calculate the burn size as needed. We came up with a device that interfaces with a glucose meter to then connect with an insulin infusion pump to give real-time changes in insulin much more accurately. It removes a human in the event that they make a calculation error, as an example. But now, moving on from that, from these engineers, let's talk about some other studies that have been going on. I'm not sure if you've been here yesterday or today, but Dr. Diana Farmer, did she do her talk yet? Well, she is uh, the world's first woman fetal surgeon. Dr. Harrison here is the world's first fetal surgeon. And they're out at UCSF. Dr. Farmer now is the chair of surgery here at UC Davis. But it all started more or less with this paper in 1995 where there's a condition called spina bifida. And babies that have this, there's a neurotube defect which exposes their spinal cord, which predisposes them to neurological dysfunction when they're born. And it was believed that you can operate on this after they're born because clearly that should be safer, right? Well, Dr. Harrison and his team ultimately looked at a sheep model. They had a sheep fetus inside a, mo a mother's she a sheep with a spina bifida uh, condition um, introduced into that fetus. And they were able to operate on the fetus in utero to repair this condition and rescue neurological function. And they showed that it was safe, it was efficacious, which ultimately led into a subsequent trial led by Dr. Farmer et al. That showed that if you were to operate in utero on a human patient and fix this condition on the fetus before they were um, given, uh, when, before they were born in full term, they did a lot better. So fetal surgery to treat spina bifida is now considered ideal. This procedure could not have been refined or proven to be safe, especially to the FDA without a sheep model. And we now have a wonderful platform with a sheep where we can introduce new therapies, new procedures, such as stem cells to regenerate the damage. So this benefits a lot of people, both animals and humans alike. In another example, this is not folks from UC Davis, but I want to use this paper to highlight what is actually being done at Davis, where they're using a pig model to introduce an infarction, that is a, a, a damaged tissue from a blood clot, so in this case, a heart attack. They want to generate a heart attack so they not only identify it, but be able to regenerate the heart tissue. As you may know, once a heart has a heart attack, that tissue isn't coming back. So if, if you use stem cells and other methods to regenerate that tissue, you may be able to restore heart function after damage. And that's the point. We can't do this experimentally in people. It's not ethical. It's not potentially not safe. But you can do it in a swine model, which may be much more safe and much more cost effective and so forth. Now I want to highlight one of, my, one of uh, two of my projects, and we're looking at the topic of antibiotic therapy. I alluded to this. Is 14 days of antibiotics good enough? Well, that's what we used to use. And let's give it another variable. What about kids? As the pedi pediatricians likes to say, children are not smaller version of adults. There's a reason why there are pediatrics, uh, field of pediatrics out there. 
And what happens when you're actually sick? Your heart rate goes up. All these changes actually change how drugs are distributed in the body. Well, the problem is I can't really do studies safely or ethically in children. It's not right. They're a protected population, but we have a primate center here where we can potentially use these animals to dose with antibiotics and apply advanced mathematics, advanced mathematics to be able to model how the drugs are how the drugs are moving around the body, where they're going, and if they're effective or not, and personalize it to the patient. It's not about me coming up with a drug dosing to work for a million people. I want to be able to make each dosing applicable to each individual, and that's the future there as we see here. And these arrows show that what I learn in each of these steps will benefit each other. So what I learn in kids will benefit the rhesus macaques, the primates at primate center. What I learn in the primates will benefit the kids. And the mathematical techniques that I learned from doing this study will help either of those populations. To highlight all the people involved, and this is still just the tip of the iceberg, we have emergency medicine physicians, pathologists, myself, pediatricians, pharmacologists, to differentiate between pharmacists. Pharmacologists know all about the drug mechanics, the pharmacokinetics. They have a much more advanced understanding in this area. That's why we need them. Primate medicine. We have veterinarians to train in primate medicine. We have a PhD person who is effectively a genius in primate medicine involved in this. Surgeons, burn surgeons in this case, because they worry about this stuff, pediatric burn surgeons. And toxicologists, we're dealing with drugs. Big team. And it's necessary to make this successful. The last thing I want to cover is autopsy. This is the second project that I'm involved with uh, in recent days. Conventional autopsy, to, for those that don't know what it is, if a person dies and we want to figure out and diagnose why they died, we may have to cut them open and evaluate the tissue and so forth. Unfortunately, conventional autopsy rates are decreasing substantially. This is due to a number of reasons, all very appropriate. The first being that physicians feel that the family has suffered enough. Makes sense. Religious or cultural reasons. That's also very understandable. And sometimes, unfortunately, the clinicians just don't ask. The problem is a lot of our discoveries in medicine, such as HIV, cardiovascular disease, were actually derived from autopsies. We would not have known these people have died of these conditions without performing autopsies. What if a medical mistake was made? You would never know there was a mistake until you did the autopsy. And if you don't know if there was a mistake, how could you prevent it from happening in the future? Oops. So valuable information is lost. In a study showing that about 40% out of 25, uh, close to 2,500 autopsies, substantial information was found that would have otherwise been missed without having autopsy. So why don't we harness current technology imaging? So let's use CT scanners. Let's use MRI. Why don't we just scan the body and do our analysis non-invasively? Makes sense. I could do a full body CT scan of a human in about 15 minutes. The problem is after death, a lot of the tissue changes. So here's a mouse that has died. And you can see the tissue. You can see the lungs. You're OK with that. This is a top-down view. And you can see the lungs. You can see bones. That's pretty much it. Can't see the heart, really. You can't see the, the stomach, et cetera, and so forth. So we need contrast agents. The best thing in this scenario for things that have died is you can administer compounds that are usually toxic to living things. The problem is no one's ever done this before. How do we harness new drugs and so forth to do this? I could get a dead body, dead human body to do this, but that's not cost effective, not fair to the family, and of course, just time consuming. So we have to start small. So we should use the animal model, such as this mouse. And we can refine our methods, our doses, the compounds that we use in this smaller model, and scale it up to human cadavers. The team involved are once again pathologists, radiologists, biophysicists trained in imaging, biomedical engineers, and veterinarians. I'm looking at this mouse, I have no idea where, what these things are, but the veterinarian does, because they see it from that perspective all the time. Well, we put some contrast agent in, 1% of PTA, phosphotungstic acid, and you can start seeing visualization becomes a little bit better. Increase the concentration, you can visualize almost everything in there. So this is quite wonderful, because then you can look at the entire vasculature of the animal, see if there are any clots and so forth. So we prove, this is just, merely this summer, actually, prove that we can actually visualize these things a lot better and don't have to cut open the poor animal or potentially the patient to identify diseases. And we're moving along with this. But we can't, again, do this without the collaboration of all these disciplines together. So I want to close out and leave it open for questions that, number one, effectively all single discipline-based discoveries have been made. 
Long gone are the days of the Albert Einstein discovering the E equals MC squared. Long gone are all those days with Watson and Crick working together to find the DNA structure. Current healthcare problems must be addressed in a multidisciplinary fashion. The problems are too complex now. The problems are too big, bringing in too many fields. Substantial and amazing translational research being conducted to improve human and animal health is occurring everywhere as we speak. UC Davis, of course, is one of the leaders in that area just because we have all these fields, medicine, human medicine, veterinary medicine, and a primate center, engineering, and so forth. You do not need a med MD degree or a DVM degree or a combined degree, uh, uh, so be MD, PhD, to do this type of research. You have a PhD degree, you have a master's degree. But what really makes a difference is the best translational researchers work closely with the clinicians and the basic scientists. You are the glue that holds it together. The reason why I have been very lucky and become successful in this area is I work well with my colleagues, the burn surgeons, the pathologists, the radiologists, the bioengineers, and we have come up with a lot of solutions that you've seen, and those traits are evident in other translational scientists that you'll speak to and hear from here at this conference. I want to uh, also emphasize a quote from my mentor. Uh, he's uh, the vice dean of the med school. And he said that innovation comes from the boundaries between disciplines. I want to add to that, overcoming translational research barriers at these boundaries will generate high impact innovation. You can, <coughs> you can innovate, excuse me, but is your innovation going to make a big difference? And that's what you need to do. And if you're going to be stuck doing your own research in your own field on your own, you may not see something, a new technology, a new discovery that will truly make a big difference and that's what matters. And this is a wonderful time in research, especially translational research, because you guys are the future and this is where you can take hold of this situation, find out what you like to do and let, let the science take you where, uh, where it needs to go. Because if you were to ask me about 10 years ago what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a pediatrician. But I've done a lot more uh, interesting things since then, relating from burn surgery, toxicology, and interact with so many inspiring people that do this that I can't think of anything else I want to do besides this. So I leave it open for any questions, and hopefully I've uh, given you at least a direction to go in in terms of translational research. So questions, and please uh, step up to the mic if you have questions, or just speak loudly, I can repeat the question too. Sure. So the question is, um, we, we see a lot of human research here, animal research, but have we looked at plants? So plant biology being a good, a good question to that. That's actually um, a field that is still ongoing. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course you hear in the Amazon there are so many species of plants that have not been discovered and they could contain drugs that could help us, such as antibiotics and whatnot. And that's a huge field because a vast majority of our antibiotics were called the cephalosporins actually come from some bacteria or plant and so forth like that, or fungus. And so that's a huge field. And I don't represent it in our slides because I actually, that's one of the fields I have not been involved with in any way, but it is a fascinating field because plants are there all around us. They're part of the environment we live in and how it contributes to our health, whether it be a medicine that we can derive uh, from a plant or the fact that we have more palm trees here, does that actually improve our health because of visual, the things it gives off, and so forth. We're starting to realize that our world is a lot bigger world with the bacteria, the plants we interact with, all contributing to our health. But yes, I think it's a very important area. Other questions? Well, if there's no other questions, feel free to email me. I'm the only NAMTRAN there is on the campus, I believe. Um, so you can email me. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. And otherwise, we'll go from there and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, thank you.